morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you may be. Welcome to the session on Abu Dhabi as an ideas capital. My name is Ron Robin. I'm president of the University of Haifa in Israel. Prior to this position, I had the great privilege to be senior vice provost at NYU, where I was charged with faculty recruitment, both for NYU Abu Dhabi and NYU Shanghai. The great privilege to be at NYU Abu Dhabi at its inception. I am joined by three wonderful colleagues who will be part of this discussion. Uh, His Excellency Zaki Anwar Nuseiba, who is the cultural advisor to the president of the UAE and is also the chancellor of the United Arab Emirates University. Zaki has been in government service at the UAE since the 1960s when he served as a personal uh, interpreter to Sheikh uh, Zaid bin Sultan al Nahyan. He holds numerous positions. He's chair of the Board of Trustees of the Subon uh, University in Abu Dhabi and, of course, heads the UAE Rhodes Scholarship Program, one of the most phenomenal successes in the UAE. Uh, together with uh, Zaki, we have uh, Bernard Haikal, who I remember from his days at NYU, but is currently a professor of Near Eastern Studies and director of the Institute for Transregional Study of the Contemporary Middle East. North Africa and Central Asia at Princeton. Um, we are also pleased to have with us uh, Kwame Anthony Apia, a joint appointment both at New York Law School and the Department of Philosophy. Kwame's fields, as you will see during the course of this talk, are political and moral theory. He, he, he has quite a illustrious career in the field of the philosophy of language and, uh, and, and the mind. And we, of course, know Kwame very much from his career as a public intellectual. Very happy to see you all here with me uh, on this idea of ideas capital in Abu Dhabi. So the UAE will be celebrating its 50th anniversary this year. And NYU Abu Dhabi has been part of its history for well over 10 years. And this, this seminar here, this webinar, will explore the historical connectivity of the UAE from its early days until the present, uh, and the role of NYU Abu Dhabi as an engine, as a catalyst for this concept of the ideas capital, which we'll describe a a little later. But before we bring up that term, may I introduce another term which is almost a prerequisite for discussing the ideas capital. Um, It's a term in urban history known as instant cities, a term that was popularized um, by Gunther Barth an American urban historian who used it to describe San Francisco and Denver. These are cities that achieved uh, the status of urban centers in a matter of decades rather than centuries. And urban historians attribute the growth of such cities to the collision of, of, of three factors, of some precious commodity, of human drive and technology. So in the case of San Francisco, the case of Denver, That would be uh, gold, which was the immediate source of wealth, which enticed um, uh, individuals, entrepreneurs who had an appetite for risk and change. And technology would, of course, be railroad, it would be telegraph, breaking the sort of isolation that 19th century um, uh, Western culture uh, lived in before the rise of these technologies. And so were we to, 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 to substitute, instead of gold, we'll talk about oil. The technology we would talk about, of course, would be the internet uh, and maybe aero, aero, aero techni- technology as well. And of course, uh, the attraction to Abu Dhabi of people who are willing to risk for uh, their, their, their fortune, their talent, for the opportunities that are available in a city like that. And an instant city seems almost a, a prerequisite uh, for, for an ideas capital. And I wonder, Zaki, if I could ask you, having been witness to this from the very beginning, how did this happen? What, what were the major catalysts uh, for the rise of Abu Dhabi in such a short period of time? Uh, thank you very much, Ron. It's such a pleasure to be with you and with my other colleagues for this very important occasion. Uh, when I talk about Abu Dhabi city and its phenomenal rise over the last 50 years, basically, Uh, I would like first to put it within a historical context, because I believe that many people have the image, the misconception that 
somehow the, whole, the Abu Dhabi roads in the middle of sand where nothing existed and it became what it is today, the capital of the UAE, a country that has been established itself as a leading uh, center, financial, economic, knowledge center in the region, in the Middle East, with an open, tolerant society, a cosmopolitan community that lives together, works together. And in fact, we must remember that this region has always been a very important one in geostrategic terms. The Arabian Peninsula was, is at the crossroads of three continents surrounded by water. The Arabian Sea has served as a trading route to the world's wealth since 3000 BC, when ships uh, traversed between Southern Arabia and India, exchanging copper, teakwood, incense, and so on. And ships landed at Arabian ports, growing numbers of Arabs moved to these market and trading towns, which formed into cities, becoming centers of local, regional, and long distance trade. And nearby oases prospered as centers of agriculture, stops for the trading routes crossing the peninsula. So the UAE has, it has been through stages of, uh, of uh, rise and decline. In the 19th century, the UAE or Abu Dhabi under the leadership of the Al Nahyan family of the Bani Yas uh, Federation, in fact, established a very powerful uh, urban center in uh, the region with a strong uh, pearling uh, fleet, fishing fleet, uh, and uh, had established a measure of prosperity and development, but then went uh, through uh, difficult periods in the 20th century, in the, turn, uh, the beginning of the 20th century, for a number of reasons, including, of course, this, the First World War, the, the Great Decline, the Great Depression, uh, the uh, Second World War, the issues that brought poverty and uh, uh, deprived the people of the UAE from the means of leading uh, a, a a decent standard of living. Sheikh Zayed came into this, uh, into the, into our history, if you like, at this juncture. He became ruler in 1966. Abu Dhabi has been in decline for a number of decades, and yet has was able to find oil. And uh, the first barrel was exported in 1962. But we remember that. The oil barrel at the time was under 50 cents, and the income that came from it was not that exorbitant. And he had to face, as when he became ruler in 1966, a number of challenges, some of them internal. He, we had to start building infrastructures from nothing uh, and without the manpower that can drive this uh, development that he needed. But at the same time, external problems. The region was and still is a turbulent region, uh, uh, full of uh, disturbances, conflicts, uh, even rebellions in, in, in parts of the peninsula. And within this historic uh, period, uh, the British, who had kept special treaty relations with the Gulf for over 150 years, decided uh, in 1968, in fact, that they would uh, withdraw their umbrella of protection from this region. And so Zayed had also to face this problem uh, of how do we secure our sovereignty? How do we defend our uh, independence? How do we make sure that we can survive the challenges of the 70s that lay ahead of us? And in effect, his vision from the very outset was very clear. And so clear that I remember at an interview in 1968, he set it out uh, before us and an in, uh, at a, in an interview that I was uh, carrying with him, where he told us that we must, first of all, build a federation. That is, we must bring these seven emirates uh, that are close to each other historically, tribally, uh, we must bring them together to set up a viable political structure. And then we must work with this viable political structure to establish partnerships and relationships of friendship 
uh, with countries around us in the region, with the wider Arab world and with the world, because we need our partners uh, are also the oil consuming nations in the West. Uh, and we need to establish partnerships with them based not only on economic uh, and security uh, issues, but also on the, on, the, on, but on the level of values. And this is why we need to open our country to the cultures of the world to open bridges to the rest of the world so that we can build our own country. And then he said, and we must use this wealth, the wealth that uh, we have today, in order to bring prosperity and well-being to our country, but not only to our country, because we must also extend a hand of help to all those around us. He always said that in order to survive in, a, in, a, in, in this world, you cannot be uh, safe if you live in prosperity while all around you uh, countries are in poverty, peoples are in poverty. So we must extend our hand to those around us and give them what we can uh, in order to bring also prosperity and well-being uh, generally around us. And then the third, uh, if you like, pillar of that vision was to say in opening up to our uh, the cultures of the world in bringing modernization to our society. We must at the same time um, make sure that we preserve our traditions, our heritage, uh, our culture and values, and uh, those can become the reciprocal in which we can work with the other cultures around us. So this, these were the beginnings. And if, if you would like, the development of Abu Dhabi and then the establishment of the Federation and then the working together in order to make this federation succeed where everybody at the time, including journalists and diplomats that I had to see or translate for when they met with Sheikh Zayed, they were all forecasting doom for this region because of the security situation in the area. In effect, became what it is today. It was an ideas, uh, you like, run vision, and it was a vision that was based on the also basic principle that investing in the future means investing in our young people, investing in stability, durability, uh, sustainability for our country means that while welcoming uh, people from all around us, because we are a small nation and we need people to come and work and help us, in building our country, in making ourselves uh, prosper on a world stage, we must also work together so that we preach the values of tolerance and openness and uh, uh, bringing cultures together rather than be involved in the ideological conflicts that are around us. And this, in effect, developed throughout the 70s, the 80s, the 90s, where the UAE and Abu Dhabi city traversed many decades of uh, truly troubled, if you like, uh, periods around it, wars, uh, revolutions around it, uh, confrontations in the Middle East. Uh, it was able to establish what it did. As we move into the new generation of leaders, uh, after Sheikh Zayed passed away in 2004, this vision for the, for the cities, but this is the, whole, the cities of the UAE, Abu Dhabi, but also Dubai and Sharjah and the other cities of the, of the Federation continue to develop on the same pillars, if you like, that Sheikh Zayed had outlined in his first years of uh, government. So that the UAE, the Abu Dhabi continued to be open to all communities. We have just recently introduce the uh, golden visa rule, for instance, that would welcome investors as well as artists and innovators, uh, computer programmers, coders, uh, in order to come and live and work with us. We have established, as you know, universities, uh, because Sheikh Zayed said from the outset that our investment in our youth means we have to invest in education, and investing in education also means uh, investing in culture. Uh, we cannot have an education system that is not enriched by a, by a, by a varied cultural uh, offering as well. And we have developed 
this throughout the decades as well after Sheikh Zayed passed away with the new leadership working so that Abu Dhabi city will continue uh, to be a global city able to compete internationally, able to be a center for ideas. Again, uh, because we are a small nation, we need to be open. We need to have, as we did for thousands of years, as our cities have been for thousands of years, centers where people came and lived and worked and produced wealth, if you like. Uh, we have to continue to do the same. And I hope that the, although we see around us in the Middle East declining, if you like, uh, societies, uh, crumbling uh, government systems, unfortunately, we see the rise of sectarianism, uh, of uh, religious extremism, of terrorism. We hope that we can be a model and that we can continue to offer an opportunity and a glimmer of hope for all those young people in the region, in the Arab world, in the world, that you can come and live with us, build our cities, and be part of the story that we want to have in Abu Dhabi. I hope, Ron, that answers your question in one way or another. Thank you so much, uh, Zaki. I'd like to pick up on one of the points that you mentioned, and that is the issue of openness. Uh, the tolerance for cultural diversity, which I think uh, characterizes Abu Dhabi uh, in particular. And of course, uh, NYU Abu Dhabi is a, is a prime example of that. NYU Abu Dhabi, and as the city, it reflects the city, has always been a bastion of um, this sort of cosmopolitan impulse that you've been describing right now. And I, I wonder if I could ask Kwame um, uh, to, to comment on this. Um, you know, today, I, I think you've stated many times that cultural diversity, this co cosmopolitan impulse, is a precondition for a thriving modern world. And yet it faces uh, other trends, such as identity politics and um, the closing of the mind that we see in more than one place. Um, what do you think is the future? Um, what does the future hold for th this issue, which is so dear to your heart, the co cosmopolitan impulse? Uh, well, I'm, I'm honored to be here in this conversation with, with, with uh, these colleagues, and um, I was, um, it's very helpful to have that background, um, I think, uh, to the history of uh, the region and of the Abu Dhabi in particular. Um, so, obviously, at the moment, as you've suggested, there's a worry about a lot of, sort of uh, closedness developing in the world uh, for lots of reasons, um, His Excellency mentioned. Uh, some of them, uh, but another one is, which isn't a, perhaps such a big problem in the region, but is a big problem in the world, is a kind of um, nativist populism, which you see in many, many countries today, which closes people off from contact with uh, people that they think of as different from themselves. I, I, you know, I um, know that there is, a, there is one human impulse, which is to settle into a locality and to be deeply invested in it in one place in its history and to close yourself off to others and that's always been one side of humanity but the progressive side of humanity the side of humanity that has brought us uh, great civilizations uh, and the rewards of those not just for the people in them but for the people that they interact with has is the other side which is that history of openness and creativity that comes from a willingness to um, engage with people who are not like yourself and accept that they will remain unlike you. Lots of people want to travel into the world and change the world to be like them. That's what missionaries do. But, but the cosmopolitan impulse is to go into the world and meet people and say, I, I value the fact that you are not like me and that together, me in my way and you in your way, that we can make a better world if we accept that uh, this kind of difference, whether it's uh, religious, philosophical, aesthetic, uh, is, is, is going to be part of the, the human future, should be part of the human future, because as the great British philosopher John Stuart Mill said, we're all engaged in what he called experiments of living. And we can learn from each other's experiments of living. I may not become a Buddhist or a Muslim or a Hindu, but I can learn from Buddhism. I can learn from 
Islam, I can learn from Hinduism. And, and my hope is that Hinduism and uh, Islam and Buddhism can learn from the traditions that I uh, have grown up in and uh, represent. And uh, I'm, I'm no longer a believing Christian, but I grew up in a Christian culture, a very Christian culture. I went to Sunday school and prayed every day. Um, and, I, I, and while I am no longer a believer, that, the, that experience of growing up in that particular tradition is, is one of the things that I hope that, 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 that I can sort of bring when I engage in conversation with, with, with people who are of, of all religions and none. So I think that um, that sense that we, we profit from in engagement across difference is just such a huge part of what's made uh, the human world so interesting. I just One of my favorite examples is a very simple one. Great 17th century Japanese poet, Matsuo Basho. Um, his religion is Buddhism, which comes from India. He's a Zen Buddhist. His script is Chinese, but he's deeply Japanese as well. And I think, uh, you know, Shakespeare gets some of his best stories from Rome, and his most famous character is a Dane, Hamlet. Uh, so I think that, you know, a lot of what we most value in the world comes from those kind of cross-cultural encounters. Um, Islam itself has profited enormously over the centuries as it spread by uh, learning from the places that it moved into, uh, just as those places learned from the growth of Islam. So, um, and that learning from others is at the heart of three great modern enterprises. One is science. There's nothing more transnational than science. The sciences work because people in China and Russia and Abu Dhabi and, and uh, Chicago are in conversation with one another about mathematical ideas, about biological ideas, about genetics. Um, and the second great modern institution that is deeply dependent upon this trans transnational sharing and, and exchange is, of course, the university itself. Uh, without the university's uh, openness to everywhere, which you see manifested in NYU Abu Dhabi more than I think in almost any university in the world, uh, it, it, which has this incredible transnational student body from students from every continent, um, faculty from all over. Um, and it, it's a kind of highly developed version of this, but all the great universities of the world, indeed all the, all the mining universities of the world, uh, have this, uh, this uh, build on these transnational conversations. And the final thing is the arts. The arts are, I just mentioned this in relation to, to Basho, couldn't be more Japanese than Basho, but you couldn't be Jap Basho if you weren't open to, to Buddhism and to, and to Chinese script. Um, uh, the arts, uh, I mean, in, in the Emirates now, you have a number of important uh, uh, art uh, festivals and uh, biennials, and you have uh, the Louvre, Abu Dhabi, and so on. And these are the fact that artists from everywhere participate in these things is a feature of the contemporary art world that is there also, even in things like literature, which you might think of as being something that's very difficult to share because, because language is so intricately involved in literature. But the fact is that um, literature in many languages now is shared through uh, the activity that His Excellency is an expert in, namely the activity of translation and interpretation, uh, can be shared uh, across, uh, across societies. People, uh, one of the most widely read authors in the world is, was, was my old friend uh, Chino Achebe, who was a Nigerian. Uh, he wrote in English, but he's been read in many, many languages. One of my uh, uh, favorite writers is, is the Somali writer Nuruddin Farah. Uh, he's been read by, he's very popular in Sweden, <laughs> in Swedish translation. Um, so even, even the arts that you might think of as so dependent upon locality turn out now to be flourishing in part because of transnational exchanges. So the sciences, the literature and the humanities, and the arts and the university, all of these wonderful institutions uh, and practices that I have uh, lived in and among all my life and, and profited so much from and seen my students and my colleagues profit from, all of them depend upon this openness. So as I said at the start, I understand the, the, the attractions of, of home, of, of being in a place. And I, my own view is that you can combine um, a sense of place, a sense that you come from somewhere, and that the place you come from is important in a special way to you with a recognition that you will profit from encounters with other people who have homes that matter to them. 
Thank you so much, Romy. That was that was uh, fascinating. I would like to pick up on some of the points that you mentioned here. Uh, these prerequisites for 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 a thriving city and a thriving university, being transnational, the creation of knowledge, and um, artistic sharing. Uh, I would say NYU Abu Dhabi, as you mentioned, is is very much on, along those lines. It's uh, an outward-looking institution. It is well connected across the world. And of course, it's a bastion of knowledge creation, but it seems to be going against the trend that we see in other parts of, of, of MENA, of the Middle East and North Africa. In other parts uh, of our region, the trend seems to be in decline. Um, the role of universities, as the universities seem to have been marginalized in many ways, and um, cities as well uh, fall into uh, states of chaos, as we've seen quite recently even in your hometown, Bernie, uh, in, 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 in Beirut. I wonder if you'd like to describe why, why in Abu Dhabi in particular, and then why you Abu Dhabi, in, in, as an example, we have managed to buck that trend. Thank you. Um, and it's a real pleasure and honor to be here today. I mean, uh, I, I, I haven't seen uh, Anthony and I haven't seen Zaki for a long time uh, because of COVID, no doubt. And, and as well as yourself, and it's lovely to be here. Uh, I also want to say that I was very early on part of the NYU Abu Dhabi uh, project, um, and I have taught there twice, and I have never encountered a more diverse, nationally diverse uh, classroom than, than there. Uh, and what's particularly interesting about NYU Abu Dhabi is that the conversations that I had with the students were quite different from those one has here in America, especially of late where uh, America has actually, like many other places, has a turn towards a kind of inward, very uh, a, an obsession with personal identity uh, rather than an interest in broad uh, global ideas and trends. And that, that's something that I, I found in Abu Dhabi and, and appreciated greatly. Um, now to answer your question, um, I think, uh, Unfortunately, in the Middle East, the Middle East is buffeted by many, many um, um, negative trends um, to do with, um, you know, uh, to wars. Um, uh, certainly, America's invasion of Iraq was a terrible, uh, uh, a really, truly terrible and unnecessary war that had uh, radicalizing effects uh, across the region, destroyed Iraqi society, um, and and we've seen also the persistence of um, um, terribly uh, repressive authoritarian regimes in places like Syria, uh, you know, Algeria, Libya, and so on, that have ultimately um, succumbed to civil war as a result of uh, the events surrounding the Arab Spring. Now, turning to Abu Dhabi and, and to the other, uh, to the other uh, states in the Gulf, I think uh, there are several impulses that are moving them in a very different direction from, say, Syria or Lebanon or even Iran. Uh, and that is that, on the one hand, uh, they see that oil is a commodity that's likely to end fairly soon in terms of value, um, A, because it's going to run out, two, because the world is moving away from fossil fuels uh, because of uh, concerns around climate change. And uh, there's a decision that's very clearly made you have to, a country like Abu Dhabi, a country like the UAE, has to move away from um, move away from oil and build some other form of uh, wealth and uh, value generation. And that can only be through um, uh, the development of human capital. And, and so I think that's a, a deliberate decision that was made by the leadership there, that you have to build human capital and that universities are key, are instrumental to development of human capital. And the second realization is that if you are a small place like the UAE and you want to thrive, you need to build what are called gateway cities. These are cities that uh, essentially, uh, you know, provide for a modicum of uh, order, stability, the rule of law, where the light switches work, where water comes out of the tap, and that act as a hub for a broader, wider hinterland in which the taps don't work and in which electricity doesn't uh, come on when you uh, turn on the switch. Um, 
and 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 that the the the, uh, the value that you can provide to the region as a whole is precisely because you are this place uh, that is both a, a, a generator of wealth and uh, and uh, and and provides stability. This is what Beirut once was and no longer is, unfortunately. It is what Tel Aviv is today, uh, and it is uh, what Dubai and Abu Dhabi are today as well. And you look to the Saudis, and you will see that in Saudi Arabia they're doing, they're trying to do the same thing. Uh, Saudi Arabia is trying, has seen this in Abu Dhabi, and and in the UAE, and they very much want to build the same kind of gateway city. They want to provide the same uh, types of uh, a, a kind of an open culture one in which religious reactionaries are there, but very much uh, uh, told that they cannot interfere in the public uh, life of people. Uh, and, and so it's, it's interesting that you see the UAE model being reproduced, uh, at least in countries like Saudi Arabia. Um, and that's, I think, a very good thing. Uh, it's a very good thing. And I, and I hope what will happen is that once uh, a country like the UAE, that model becomes um, an obvious one to follow that other countries will also want to follow. Egypt, potentially Iraq, hopefully Syria one day, and Lebanon should also return to what it once was. But those are the two kind of trajectories that you see in the region. You see a trajectory that is uh, one towards openness and the building of human capital and of tolerance, so this is the UAE, the UAE. and you have another, tra another trajectory that's being followed by countries like Syria and unfortunately Lebanon, and certainly Iran as well, in which intolerance prevails and in which a form of religious reactionary thinking um, is used to dominate and control people. Uh, um, and and I, hope, I hope that uh, we'll see one of these two trajectories prevail over the other. Thank you, Bernie. Uh, I pick up on that theme of openness that you mentioned right now. Um, openness thrives uh, or hinges upon human interaction. We're now um, more than a year into a crisis which has isolated us. And uh, I wonder how the, this, this sense of openness, which is part of the university world, uh, will, will, will survive as we move forward. It is, um, we are after all um, social creatures. We need contact and that contact has been cut off. Uh, we have become addicted to technology and the comfort of technology, which allows us to ensconce ourselves uh, in, our, in, our, in our little worlds. Um, what, what would be the future of a place like, uh, you know, any of our universities which has gone through this type of um, isolation uh, in, in the future? How can we um, resurrect what I think is the right model? NYU has always been based on an idea of bricks and mortars, not technology always having a physical presence in places which can create this concept of an ideas capital. But that now is, um, is challenged, both by a series of crises, health crises that we are facing now, and of course, uh, by the comfort of technology. Is there any way to, to bridge that? Uh, I will ask you maybe, Kwame, to, to relate to that first. Well, I think one thing that's happened as a result of the pandemic, is that we now have a very clear sense of what we miss if we just talk to each other through machines. We miss the everyday encounters, the coffee shop conversations that are essential part of uh, university life. I don't bump into my colleagues. I, I, go to, I meet with my colleagues all the time on Zoom, and I'm glad we can. But I don't bump into them in the corridor and have conversations. And the graduate students don't bump into me and say, I was thinking about this, is this a good idea? Or I bump into them and say, I was thinking about that, was that a good idea? And that, um, that sense of the university as a physical place is something that's far from being undermined by this experience has been, I think, uh, underlined by it. I think we, we, we have a stronger sense of the importance of that. Now, I'm very glad we had this technology and last, Term, you know, I was teaching students, and there were, I had students in in Bangladesh and Shanghai and Abu Dhabi and um, and, and and parts of India and, and Australia and Latin America and so on, uh, and we were able to go on. But I, they very much missed uh, the interactions that they would have been having 
if they'd been on one of the uh, on the campus they were supposed to be on. And if I may say, I mean, this this uh, blockage uh, by the pandemic, which is of course necessary, we, we needed to close down in order to save human lives, and I, I don't object to that. But that um, that closure is a so is is produces results that are analogous to other forms of closure that are not necessary. I mean, it's it's getting it, under under the last administration in the United States, it got harder to get visas for uh, students and um, and colleagues to visit us. Um, Chinese government isn't always very helpful in, in, in getting us, uh, in, in making sure that Shanghai is a center that everybody that needs to come to can come to. And so I think we need to remind governments of what the, the, the government of, um, of, of the Emirates seems uh, so clearly <laughs> to have a grip on, which is that this, th this is bad for you. It is bad for your society to close itself off in those ways. And, and the, the, the openness has, you have to pay the costs of openness, which include annoying people and p people who say things you don't want them to say. And, and even some people who are not very open themselves being allowed to speak, like, like the religious reactionaries in, in Jidda. But, um, but I think in the end, you know, I, I believe deeply that, that the culture of openness is the one that will serve humanity best. And so, my own feeling about the pandemic is, as I say, that it's reminded us of the importance of those actual interactions. I'm, I was able, I, I have a Nigerian brother-in-law and Nigerian nephews and, um, and, and now great nieces, two of whom were born during the pandemic. Uh, I was able to be present at their naming ceremonies through Zoom, and I was glad about that. But the being in the room with a baby who's being named, who's a member of your family, is a very different thing. Uh, from knowing about it because you can see it going on on the screen. So I say, we, we, uh, I was glad to be able to do that, but I would prefer to be able to do the other thing. And, and I think people have seen that. And so I hope that ordinary people will, will remind uh, their rulers, when their rulers forget it, uh, that this, is a, this kind of um, access to one another is really, really important, of course, for the life of the university, but for the life of society more generally. Thank you, Kwame. So, B Bernie, I wonder how much um, the issue of isolation, both through technology and, of course, the pandemic, has been a catalyst for the type of churn that we've seen, and how does one counteract that? You know, if you um, if you look at you know the Arab Spring events that started in two thousand ten, I think they were a result of several several factors. One of them was the arrival of the internet in the late 1990s. And that basically allowed uh, ordinary Arabs across the, the, the Arab world to see what it was like to be to live as a, Chinese, as a Chinese person, as an American, as a Japanese, as an Indian. And they could all see that things were getting better for uh, other people around the world. And yet uh, they were not for them, for, for the Arabs themselves. And it was also, um, a technology and a, it, it was a catalyst for bringing people together, making them think uh, and mobilize in ways that otherwise uh, they could not, largely because governments controlled the sources of information in the past, and that was broken and severed with uh, with these technologies. Um, I think that they're, that, you know, that they're very important and they will remain uh, important. Uh, what they haven't been able to do, though, is um, especially during the pandemic, is to get people organized uh, politically uh, around specific sets of issues. In fact, in some ways, if you look at Lebanon, for instance, in October uh, of 2019, when you had um, uh, finally a breakdown in, 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 and a revolt against the corruption of the political elite there, um, what happened was uh, this technology allowed a lot of Lebanese to mobilize and to come down into the streets. Uh, but I think there was something like three or four hundred different groups uh, uh, that were represented. And they never co coalesced uh, around a, a single leadership or two or three leaderships. And as a result, they remained very fragmented and unable to affect change uh, in, in Lebanon. And so you know, this, this, this technology, I mean, just like what Anthony just said, you know, it has some very good, good sides to it, and I, we welcome it, but it also has limitations. 
and it can never really quite replace the physical uh, ex presence of people, the exchange of ideas, certainly at universities, and, um, and, uh, and, and it atomizes in many ways as well, in ways that, you know, create these little bubbles where people just kind of live in echo chambers and don't really quite communicate with each other. So my own feeling, I'm not an expert on this, but my own feelings about it is, that, is, is one of ambivalence, that, you know, there are good things, but there are also terrible things as well and limitations. Thank you, Bernie. Uh, Zaki, Abu Dhabi seems to have bucked the trend. Technology um, has been used to bring people together in a society that began at least as a very tribal society. Uh, how, how did this happen? Why, why has Abu Dhabi been able to harness technology uh, for unity rather than division? Uh because, Ron, I believe that Abu Dhabi and the UAE has always been a country that is open to the future. I mean, it started from, as I, from very tough beginnings, but it was in an area that was full of challenges, existential challenges. It was a small country with a small population and oil wealth, but that was under also threat from uh, the Germanic uh, neighbors. It was also facing issues about the Middle East around it, which was melting, as uh, all my colleagues have been discussing, and especially Bernie, in the last few decades. And therefore, technology was central to the way that the UAE has looked at its future. And I tend to be an optimist, uh, Ron, I'm uh, in everything. So uh, I agree with you and my colleagues how sad it is to be isolated. I mean, there was nothing sadder than going to the United Arab Emirates University, where you came to see me, where we have uh, 14,000 students, and yet the university campus, of course, is empty, so is the Sorbonne. Uh, New York University managed a little better in keeping some kind of physical uh, presence in the universities. But, and I could see how happy and, you know, students were when I brought them in small groups or faculty to talk to them. But personally, in fact, I believe that the, we are, we, what we did is to, first of all, put trust in a technology that brings vaccinations rapidly into play. And I believe this is the pathway for the future. We need to have vaccinations to vaccinate a whole population. We are already, I believe, about 80 or 90% vaccinated, but it's not enough only to vaccinate your own population, people who are living in your uh, country, but also to help other countries vaccinate uh, their populations because we are not safe until everybody is safe. And this is why the UAE has recently sent half a million uh, vaccines to Tunisia, for instance, which is going through a uh, hard time uh, health-wise. But personally also, I, I am not, like the UAE is not really suspicious of technology. I believe that technology, I agree with Bernie, it needs to be looked at, it needs to be perhaps better monitored and better understood and better worked out. But I am a firm believer that technology is also a way for the future. It's a future pathway for humanity. And I believe with the development of artificial intelligence, as you know, we have now a university, the Mohammed bin Zayed University for Artificial in, uh, Intelligence. We have a minister for artificial intelligence. We have just given golden visas to 100 decoders worldwide who will be interested to come and live here and work on artificial intelligence with us. So I believe that technology would also help us in the future. I agree with all with you and my colleagues that face-to-face -face meetings are important, but I believe that technology could bring us things we have not yet begun to dream of or realize where talking like this to each other in a Zoom setting could also become a, an avatar kind of uh, conference meeting where we could meet uh, physically without actually having to travel those vast distances where we could listen to orchestras and operas uh, actually staged in front of us. I believe technology has great uh, future in it and I hope that humanity would be wise enough to know how to use it. Can I Thank just say, I, mean, I, th I think that's a, 
the, the crucial point, and I completely agree with, uh, with what His Excellency just said, the crucial point is that um, new technologies uh, require a, a social management. They require the development of new cultural uh, techniques and context. That's what happened with the rise of, of writing and then with the rise of print culture and so on. We had to figure them out. And it, in the case of print culture, it took a very long time uh, to figure out how to manage uh, the, 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 the production, the sharing, the spread of these things. But, um, but, but you know, when Gutenberg printed the first Bible, he didn't realize that he was doing something would mean that in the end, the Christians of Europe could have a, each have a copy of the Bible for themselves, each human being, each individual. That was just that would have been a pipe dream uh, before these technologies were were uh, developed. So, um, and I, I I know myself that I would not have had a career as an academic if there hadn't been computers. I can't I can the only way I can compose is on a machine. Uh, I was lucky enough that I'm old enough that there were no personal computers when I was a graduate student, but young enough that I was given a computer account on a mainframe, and that was how I wrote my dissertation. <laughs> And I, I couldn't have typed it, uh, or, or, and I couldn't read my handwriting. So I'm very much aware of the, of the power of these technologies, but, I, but you know, they always have upsides and downsides, and we have to develop the social technologies to manage the downsides and to take advantage of the upsides. And that's what the challenge is of AI. That's what the challenge of artificial intelligence is. Of course, artificial intelligence is going to displace lots of jobs, for example, but we have to figure out how to share the wealth created by artificial intelligence, not necessarily by, for example, by giving everybody a job. We have to figure out how to share the wealth produced by these technologies and to share the positive things while managing, while managing the downside. And that's, that's a big intellectual challenge. Uh, and it's why you need imaginative people gathered together uh, to think about it. Uh, that's, that's being an ideas capital means you've got people bumping up against each other who are seeing aspects of this problem and each of them can may have an idea about how to to help it, and then we can we can um, we can criticize each other's ideas and develop each other's ideas and build on them. So I'm optimistic too about the, the positive side. I just think with Bernie that it's really important that we pay attention to the negative sides and that we manage them intelligently, which I believe we can. So the best place to manage these uh, I, these concepts intelligently to understand how to balance technology is, of course, at the university. There's no doubt that the, the sort of creativity that we have at places like NYU Abu Dhabi, UAU, and, of course, New York University in all its splendor, not to mention Princeton, which is well represented in this conversation. I think uh, uh, that's our role. I'm, I'm a historian by trade. Um, I barely predict the past, and I hesitate to predict the future. But I do think... Uh, um, uh, universities in general and the universities in the Emirates in particular are the places where technology, entrepreneurship, but also tolerance for diversity will manage to strike a balance. And it's on this optimistic note that I'd like to thank uh, our participants, uh, Bernie Heiko, um, Kwame Anthony uh, Apia, and of course, Zaki Noseba. I'm Ron Robin. Thank you so much for, for listening to us today. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.